Okay, I think we will get started. Um, welcome to the webinar, Pediatric Vehicular Heat Stroke, the how, why, and what to do as bystanders, parents, healthcare providers, and child passenger safety technicians. This webinar is sponsored by the Healthcare Project at the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, or MIMS, which is funded by the Maryland Highway Safety Office. I'm Suzanne Ogaitis Jones, and I coordinate this project. Also with us today, although her camera doesn't seem to be working, is Cindy Wright Johnson, who's the director for the Emergency Medical Services for Children program, and she'll be monitoring the uh, questions in case any of you have them. Um, before we get underway, I want to make sure you know the basics of GoToWebinar. You're all in listen-only mode right now. To hide and show the, or show the control panel, click on that orange arrow. Um, if you have any questions or comments, write them in the questions box at any time. And Cindy, as I said, will be monitoring that. And we will hold the questions till the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website for future listeners. This webinar can be claimed by child passenger safety technicians for community education credit. Unfortunately, it doesn't qualify for the technical credit. And EMS clinicians, if you wish to receive credit, send us your name and your provider number at cpsmims.org. So I will sort of introduce our speaker, but really she's going to introduce herself because we actually recorded this um, presentation with Dr. Donnelly back in January, and it was made at the time for an audience of EMS clinicians. Um, but it's this is a highly relevant topic still. In fact, I hate to say it, but as of yesterday, there are now 14 deaths due to pediatric vehicular heat stroke. Um, yesterday's death was in Washington, D.C. of a three-month-old, um, and it's still hot outside, and there's still a risk, and there will be for some time still this year. So it's very relevant and I think um, at places Dr. Donnelly will reference things as if you are an EMS clinician, but um, I am not a clinician and I found it fascinating to hear kind of some of the recommendations and I hope I never need to use it, but you never know. Oops. So without further ado, um, Cindy's going to put on Dr. Donnelly's presentation and at the end of that, um, I will come back and talk, uh, give a few updates and talk more about resources. My name is Dr. Katie Donnelly, uh, and I'm going to be presenting to you today, uh, It's Getting Hot in Here, Pediatric Heat Illness. So who am I? Because I think it's always important to know who you're getting uh, information and advice from. Well, I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. I'm also the medical director for Safe Kids D.C., our mission is to prevent unintentional injuries in children in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Today, we're going to be talk we're going to have three objectives. Our first is to describe the signs and symptoms of pediatric heat illness and the associated steps EMS clinicians take when providing medical care. Two, we're going to discuss why children are uniquely vulnerable to heat illness, especially veh vehicular heat stroke. And three, we're going to outline steps healthcare professionals can take to provi provide vehicular heat stroke prevention awareness to their community, as well as available resources that can be used. So, why should you care about this? Well, heat is the third leading cause of death among high school athletes. Uh, the first is head injuries, and the second is uh, cardiac causes. Uh, there's an average of 38 hot car deaths per year, mostly in young children. And as I'm sure you're all aware, the average temps are getting hotter. Uh, the U.S. is getting hotter and hotter each summer, and we're going to see more and more extreme heat events uh, that we as medical providers all need to be uh, prepared for. So what is the normal response to heat um, for any for an adult or a child? Well, your hypothalamus, which you can see it right there, uh, sits at the base of your brain, and it's our temperature control. So it, uh, it does two things, or, or it has two parts that are working. The posterior hypothalamus uh, it senses heat and uh, promotes vasodilation and flow increase to the skin. Um, this blood flow may represent 30% of cardiac output. Um, so folks are usually uh, when they're, when they're heating up, they're very tachycardic, they might be flushed because you're seeing all that blood go to their skin. 
the anterior hypothalamus increases sweat production. The goal of both of these responses is to reduce excess body heat. Uh, your body's goal now is to get heat up to the surface so it can be transferred away from the body and they can come down to a more comfortable temperature. Uh, so that's important to know because you have to understand how heat can then escape from the body. And there are three main ways heat uh, transfers away from the body. The first is conduction. So that's transfer of heat between two solids by touching. Uh, so for example, if you were to put an ice pack on your neck, heat would move from your body into the ice pack uh, and, and would escape your body. Uh, the second method is called convection. That's the transfer of heat to the movement of liquids or gases. That's why these big misting fans that you've seen on the on the sidelines of, of football games have become so popular because they help to dissipate heat away from the body by both spraying you with liquid and using air uh, to um, move that heat away from your body. Third is evaporation. The trans that's the transfer of heat through the change from a liquid to a gas. This is the primary method that sweating works. So uh, heat goes into the liquid that we sweat out and then evaporates off our body, taking heat with it. Um, and it's the only natural kind of passive method our body has to get rid of heat. Now, all three of these are important to think about because this is going to both talk about how people get in trouble with the heat and with humidity and how uh, you as EMS clinicians might be able to help people uh, when um, they're, they're suffering from heat illness. So how do we measure how difficult it is for a person to kind of be able to tolerate the heat? Um, because as we know, you can only, evaporation can only do so much. If it's very, very humid out, uh, you're unable to evaporate um, heat off your off your skin when you sweat. That's why you stay so soggy for so long when it's really hot and really humid. So um, the first kind of measure of how um, how a, how a human being is going to behave in the heat and the humidity, that kind of like real feel temperature, was the heat index. So you can see on this that it can get um, it can be pretty cool out, you know, 88 or 90, and feel pretty miserable and be pretty dangerous to humans if the humidity is quite high in the 90 to 95% range, which I'm sure we've all experienced both in DC and Maryland. Um, and also it doesn't take very much humidity for it to be pretty dangerous the higher up it goes. So for a while, this was the main way of kind of understanding how heat and humidity interacted and what was dangerous to human beings. What you might now see in uh, moving forward is something called the wet bulb globe temperature. And you might see this reported on the Weather Channel, or you might see this uh, talked about um, on, sometimes I've seen them uh, on different sporting events. Um, and it's trying to capture a much more overall measure of heat stress. So it measures both the ambient temperature, so what, the, what, it, what it actually is outside, whether that's 90 or 85, and it also takes into account humidity, wind speed, sun angle, and cloud cover. Uh, and there are some uh, devices, like the one you see on the screen, that purport to measure that. But usually, it's a, it's a relatively complex kind of measurement uh, process. Um, and it takes all this into account because, as I'm sure you've experienced in your own life, each one of those makes it feel more or less comfortable. When, it, when there's a nice breeze going, uh, when the sun is much closer to the horizon than at midday, when there's clouds, all makes it much more comfortable to humans to be out in higher temperature. Uh, and so you may start seeing these wet bulb globe temperatures reported more frequently. Uh, the National Weather Service have put out some guidelines about how to interpret a wet, blob, a wet bulb globe temperature if you see one. Um, and really, uh, once we get past 80, uh, you should really start thinking about limiting the amount of time you're going to be out in the sun and increasing the number of breaks you have per hour. Um, 
So this can help you both in your own work, if you're, uh, if you're outside doing work, helping people, um, if you're at home and you know how hot it's going to be or what the wet bulb globe temperature is, and also to have a sense of days that you might be looking, for, uh, looking to see more heat illness in your patient population, depending on the rise of the wet bulb globe temperature. They're also starting to incorporate this into different uh, collegiate athlete uh, programs uh, to be able to say when they should delay or cancel a practice. So that might be, that will probably be incorporated more and more into high school sports uh, as wet bulb globe temperatures become more uh, kind of universally used throughout the US. So we've talked about now the different ways that heat affects the human body and uh, how we can kind of measure and have a, have a sort of quantification of how hot it is. Let's talk about some of the types of heat illness you might see on a regular day. And these are going to range from the very benign to the um, very serious and very deadly uh, with a focus on children. So heat rash or kind of colloquially known as prickly heat uh, this is an erythematous papular rash. It's caused by obstruction of sweat glands, so much more common in kids with their kind of immature sweat glands. Uh, it can be itchy uh, and it can kind of erupt all over the body, but is much more likely to be to show up in areas underneath clothing, which is kind of been trapping sweat against the body. This is a completely benign and self-limited rash. Uh, there is nothing you have to do for this. Um, really, treatment is much more about prevention. So having kids and adults uh, wear light, loose clothing when it's going to be hot and try to get them to avoid overheating. Next, we're going to talk about heat edema. So I know I personally have experienced this when I've been walking around, sometimes down near the monuments. Uh, it's, it shows up as swelling in the hands and feet and any other uh, dependent areas. Um, the pathophysiology, so there's, it, it shows up in unacclimatized individuals in heat. Uh, they're walking around, they're getting hotter, they experience vasodilation, and they're having some venous pooling, um, and then that shows up in their dependent areas. So uh, the way I usually see this in the emergency department is uh, a tourist from out of town has been walking around downtown DC and is concerned their child looks puffy, especially in their hands and feet. Their body temperature is typically quite normal, and this is unrelated to heart failure or kidney disease. There is nothing wrong with a body that does this. This is a natural response to heat uh, in unacclimatized individuals. The treatment, first off, for everything heat-related is remove them to a cooler environment, let that vasodilation kind of calm down and get back to normal, and then elevation and compression, uh, trying to get that swelling down. There is no need for any lab work or other kinds of, of evaluation. This should go away on its own. Now getting into some of the more distressing and serious um, heat diseases, um, heat cramps. And I certainly have experienced these. I'm sure you guys have all experienced these. These are brief, intermittent, but absolutely excruciating cramps. Uh, they show up in conditioned athletes after intense stress and heat. And this usually occurs during cool down, but I'm sure we've all watched the Olympics or uh, a football game or a soccer game where we've noticed someone come down with cramping. Um, and, and that is probably the same mechanism. The pathophysiology of this is salt depletion. Uh, so uh, athletes are usually pretty wise in that they will keep up with their hydration throughout um, their, either their training or their competition but sometimes the balance of the salt, of salt uh, gets off and they haven't been drinking enough, uh, drinking or eating enough salt containing foods or beverages. And so they, so they get behind uh, on their salt. If you were to check labs, which is usually not needed or indicated for these folks, uh, you might see that they had low sodium or low chloride, though neither one of those is necessary uh, to be able to diagnose heat cramps. The treatment, and that's if they're still cramping by the time they get to you, is oral salt. So either a food or an electrolyte drink like Gatorade or Powerade or one of those little packets that you can put in a water bottle. Rarely necessary, but might happen if you have, a, have someone who's just in a lot of distress and cannot eat or drink would be a normal saline bolus. Um, but usually these um, 
if, if you can eat or drink a little bit of salt, these get better and they can go about their daily lives. Now, heat exhaustion. And I want to put a caveat here. Uh, I think of heat exhaustion and heat stroke as on a continuum. So if you have someone who is experiencing signs of serious heat illness and their temperature isn't quite high enough to account for heat stroke, but you're still quite worried about them, treat them like heat stroke until, until they're looking better. And you can see it might be pretty difficult to determine heat exhaustion from heat stroke apart. Um, but heat exhaustion typically affects those who are working or playing in hot temperatures who either did not or cannot adequately replete water. So that might be the student athlete who hasn't been able to get a drink, a break for water uh, in the last hour. That could be a construction worker who um, has not been allowed a break. Uh, the, anyone can fall, um, can fall victim to heat exhaustion. Um, an elevated temperature is common, but not required. Usually with heat exhaustion, that temperature does not rise beyond 39 degrees Celsius or 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the passive physiology here is water depletion predominates. Um, these are folks that have kind of been out in the heat for a while and have not been able to keep drinking to stay up, to stay cool and stay hydrated, uh, but they may have a sodium depletion as well. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, the symptoms, and you're going to see that heat exhaustion and heat stroke can have a lot of the same symptoms. So they can have lethargy, intense thirst, they really want to drink. They have the inability to work or play. They want to sit down and find somewhere cool. They might have a headache, uh, vomiting, uh, CNS dysfunction like confusion or combativeness, hypotension and tachycardia. They're likely quite sweaty. They are still in compensatory mode. Their temperature hasn't gotten so high that they can't sweat. Um, so they're probably going to be quite sweaty as their body's trying to get rid of heat. The labs can be pretty challenging um, based on how much water and salt depletion they have. If, if they are predominantly water depleted, their, their sodium might actually be high. Um, so I would not depend on labs to kind of paint this picture for you. And the treatment, first and foremost, is removed from heat. Um, you want them to drink water or an electrolyte drink and eat salty foods if able. You want to IV hydrate them if unable. And if you have any concerns, I would transport them to emergency department um, to get them evaluated if they're not kind of perking up pretty quickly from, from their heat exhaustion. Now, heat stroke is, I would say, the most serious and, and deadly uh, form of heat illness. These folks tend to have pretty high temps, so above 41 degrees Celsius or above 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit. They have hot, dry skin, so they've gotten beyond where um, where sweating will help them, and uh, that 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 re response has probably been turned off by their body. Um, the, they, have C, they have pretty significant CNS dysfunction, so confusion, combativeness, a bad headache. They might have a seizure or have um, decorticate or disseparate uh, posturing. They're going to have a rapid heart rate with peripheral vasodilation. So remember, their body is still trying to do whatever it can at this point, um, even though they've exhausted their sweating reflex. Um, they're still trying to vasodilate and get as much heat off as possible. Um, it is possible that if they've been in um, heat stroke for a, a, a while, that they might have gone into cardiac failure. Remember that heart is working very hard, beating very hard against a pretty empty tank. If they're vasodilated, all of their fluid is kind of out in the periphery uh, and they can go into cardiac failure. Now these folks may not be very dehydrated, especially if heat stroke comes on them pretty rapidly. Um, and so it's not necessarily a fluid bolus that will be incredibly helpful to them. Um, it's really getting them out of the heat so their body can start to vasoconstrict again and cool down that heart rate. And their labs at this point might be normal. So uh, they're not going to be terribly helpful. It's getting that temperature and, and seeing what symptoms they're, uh, they're experiencing is going to be much more helpful to you. You have two goals in the treatment of heat stroke. The first goal is improve hyperpyrexia. So you want to remove clothing and you want to perform active cooling. So it's not just letting them kind of cool off in a, in a cool area, it's putting ice packs at the neck 
axilla and groin. Uh, put them in a place that has air conditioning or has an open air vehicle so they can take adv uh, advantage of convection and that kind of cool air blowing across their skin. You can help uh, promote evaporation by using, um, uh, you can spray them with cool water and use either a hand powered fan or a battery operated fan or an electric fan to kind of, again, blow air across them for convection. And then I'm going to talk to you about the TACO method. Now, the TACO method is not a put of protocol, but you may see it on the scene. And I want to encourage you to, um, if you think it's working appropriately, to not interrupt that. Um, you can stop active cooling when the temperature is less than 38.5 or 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. And your protocol states less than 102 degrees Fahrenheit. I think those are pretty similar, and I'm okay with either temperature. Um, if you come across someone who's doing active cooling, they've got the kid in an ice bath, they're doing the taco method, um, they're spraying them with water and fans, and they've got them in a cool environment, any one of those things, it is very reasonable to keep them there and to cool them until they get below a temperature of 102 before transporting them. Please feel free to, to be empowered to call Bay Station to get a backup on that if you're not sure or if, um, if you're worried that the methods that who's ever the athletic trainer, coach, person on the sideline, co-workers are doing is not sufficient, but it is okay to cool them in place before you transport them. Because again, number one goal is to improve hyperpyrexia. And this is the TACO method. So I'm going to fast forward just a touch for us. Um, so you come across someone who's having heat stroke and has passed out. Um, all you need is a tarp and water. So you're gonna roll the patient into the tarp. If you're worried about their neck, obviously support their neck, but most times you're gonna watch them go down. Then you're gonna pour ice and water onto the tarp. Um, and you're trying to first wrap them in as much cold water and ice as possible. And then uh, you're going, as you pour it on there, you're going to then pick up the edges of the tarp and oscillate them back and forth. Uh, and that's using convection and conduction, getting as much kind of um, contact uh, around them and allowing air to also pass underneath the tarp if possible. Uh, so that is not part of your protocol, but uh, it might end up being something you see in the field. and um, would be a, a, an appropriate method of cooling in the field prior to transport. Your second goal for heat stroke is to support cardiac output. Uh, remember we talked about that heart is working over time trying to get blood to the periphery uh, and they may be going into, um, they might be having significant cardiac stress right now. So you can give a full bolus while cooling if it's feasible. If you can get IV access, I wouldn't necessarily interrupt active cooling to try and get an IV. You're gonna to wanna to watch blood pressures. Remember all of that vasodilation from heat transfer, they're going to bottom out. Um, your goal is not to get them to normal, but just to keep enough of a pressure that, that they're, um, that they're perfusing their brain and their heart. Uh, they may need ionotropic support and that might be uh, beyond what um, you can do in the field, um, but remember that stressed myocardium plus continued vasodilation, you're going to try and, and choose a method that's going to allow you to support that, that heart while continuing vasodilation until they're cooler, and then obviously transport them to the nearest ED. So we've talked about heat illness. Let's talk about why kids are really unique. So one, they produce more metabolic heat than adults. Um, that is why when we were kids, we could eat whatever we wanted, uh, but now uh, we all have to watch our diets. They burn through calories, they produce a lot of heat, they're naturally kind of warmer than we are. Uh, their core temperature rises much faster than adults, so when it's 90 degrees out, it doesn't take much to heat up a, a tiny toddler compared to a full-grown adult. They have small organs that don't get rid of heat well. They have a very tiny surface area and um, they have a hard time getting heat from uh, their kidneys or their liver or their lungs out to the surface of their body to get rid of heat. 
And unfortunately, children often can't control their environments and are unaware of the danger they're in. Um, you see that anytime you are at a theme park or Disney World and you see a family dragging along a hot, sweaty, miserable toddler, they would much rather be in the pool at the hotel, but they don't get that choice. Um, and I'm sure if any of you have been around nephews or nieces or your own children, most uh, young children are completely unaware of danger and try to kill themselves on a regular basis. Uh, so we really have to step in to make sure that they can, they can be safe in the heat. So a call that's becoming all more all too common that you might be called out to in your job or as you're kind of walking along. So this is, you know, a two year old, uh, you come upon them, they're, they're in the car, they're locked in, they look sweaty and flush, they're strapped in the car seat, you're not sure what to do, you try, to you try the doors, the doors are locked, as you're about to kind of uh, start to really get worried about this kid and what are you gonna do, the mom arrives with a full cart of groceries and she says, oh yeah, I just left her in there for a minute. Um, it wasn't that hot today and she said, and you agree with her, it's 85 degrees with pretty low humidity. Um, so what's going on here? Like, why are, car, are cars dangerous to kids? Well, the two big reasons are the greenhouse effect. That allows heat into the car, but not out of it. You know, just like if you're in, you've all experienced this, sitting in a car or kind of opening that car door on a hot day and that wave of heat coming out. Um, they're really good at trapping heat, but really, really bad about getting rid of heat. Uh, and temperatures can rise really quickly, even on pretty temperate or pretty comfortable days. And children often can't get out of cars by themselves for a couple of reasons. You know, um, one, they might be in a car seat or a booster seat with difficult buckles. I mean, there is a reason why we put difficult buckles on these things that only adults can figure out because we want them to stay in their car seats uh, and kids love undoing buckles. Um, Two, they need to understand door locks. Uh, even if a kid just has a seatbelt on, it, can, it might be quite challenging for them to understand how to unlock a car door uh, and get out of the car. And it's for these two reasons why most heat death in cars occurs in young children. And we've seen a kind of worrying trend. Uh, now this may be because we weren't um, tracking these as aggressively in the past, but this graph on the right shows the hot car deaths by year in kids under 14. And I would not be too impressed by 2020's low of 26. There were a lot less folks driving around taking their kids somewhere, somewhere during the pandemic. So I suspect had that been a normal year, we probably would have been on track with the last couple of years. And it shows a worrying, a worrying trend that these car deaths are rising in kids. So we need to get the word out. Um, so why does this happen? Well, the first is the parent may not understand the danger. You know, I'm just running into the store, I'll be right there. It's not that hot of a day. And to be honest, I don't know how many of you have kids, but I've certainly experienced with my nephews, it's not always easy to bring a child into a store, especially if you're running in for one item. Uh, so we know that uh, there was a national survey done that 14% of parents admitted to leaving their child in a car when they went in to run an errand. And that number is probably less because I, I'm sure a lot of parents don't want to admit that they have left their child in the car. And also in researching this project, I came across numerous cases of parents who uh, had Child Protective Services called on them for a very brief in and out to the car. And I don't think that's the right answer either. Uh, I think we just have to keep our messaging consistent that it's probably the absolute safest thing you can do is to never leave your child in the car. Uh, they can get into trouble beyond heat stroke uh, in the car. And probably the best thing to do is to bring them in with you. Why else did this happen? Well, people forget the child was there. And you, you might say to yourself, I would never forget my child. Um, but lots and lots of parents do it every day. Uh, and it's because it's how the human brain works. So a lot of times there was a change in the routine. You know, you're not used to, you're, you're not the person that usually brings this kid or, um, you uh, have a new errand that you're supposed to do instead of uh, yeah, on the way to what you normally do, it changes your routine and you get out of the habit of going where you're going. 
kids sit in the backward facing seat. So oftentimes um, you can't see them easily from the front seat and it can be easy for them to kind of slip your mind. The child might fall asleep and, you, and they're very quiet when you get out of the car and you might forget them. And, and parents are just often exhausted. It's, it's really, it, they are juggling a lot, especially now. And to be honest, this is just how human brains work. If you've ever gotten into your car to drive to work or uh, school and realized halfway through that you don't remember much of anything of what you did while you were driving, that's because you've kind of gone into your habit place and um, because you don't need much active brain power to do something you do every day. Uh, so it can be, we have to figure out how to fight against human memory and human brains to make sure that no family has to deal with this trauma. Um, and these kind of forgotten in, in car uh, children account for about 53% of heat stroke. The third reason why this happens is the child gets into the car themselves. Uh, as I'm sure lots of us can, can relate to, a car is a big, fun adult toy. I mean, we recognize this. We make power wheels for our kids to drive around. We have made the car fun to be in. Um, cars can be pretty easy to get into if they're unlocked. They're also easy to accidentally lock, especially with little hands and little feet. And once that happens, it can be pretty hard to get into, get out of, sorry. Uh, and this includes climbing into trunks, which is a, a, a big danger zone for kids. Uh, it accounts for 28% of child, 26% of, of child heat stroke deaths. And it's for this reason that when a child goes missing, one of the first things I suggest to the family um, or searchers is to look in places that are dangerous first. So that includes uh, the car or, and trunk, the pool, um, and any other area in your house or where you're at that it could be easy for a child to get into, but pretty challenging to get out um, because kids are uh, curious and uh, want to get into things, but they don't always have the skills to get themselves out of situations. Well, um, what can you do? Well, let's first talk about what to do if you come upon a young child in a car. And we're going to assume you are a bystander right now. So if you come upon an awake child and notice stress, you know, they, they're sitting in the car, but they look comfortable. Um, they are awake and they can see you. Uh, the first thing you want to do is activate EMS. And that means as long as you aren't the EMS provider being called to the scene. Uh, so I want you to call 911. I want you to try the car door to see if it opens. Sometimes families forget to lock cars um, and you can get you can get into them easily. If it's possible, if the dark car door is locked, uh, I want, and you have more people around or you can flag somebody down, you want one person to stay with the car monitoring that child. Uh, you want another person to go to nearby businesses to try and find that parent or guardian. That might mean, you know, going into lots of local stores, the, the grocery store, the um, Target or Walmart, the nail salon, the barber shop and have them make an announcement. You know, um, there's a child left in a car, have the make and model of the car available so they can include that in the announcement and uh, and tell them, and then tell the store employees, if that person shows up, send them to the parking lot to their car, I'm going to go to the next door. If you come across an unarousable child, you know, they are slumped in their car seat, you cannot wake them up, or a child in distress, they look flush, flushed, they look sweaty, they, they're crying, um, and they're not producing tears, uh, I want you to first activate EMS. So again, call 911. And then, uh, you know, I would, I would hope that a good Samaritan law would protect you. I want you to break into that car. Uh, and I'm sure you have much better methods of breaking into a car than I do uh, at my uh, disposal. But just remember that, especially in the child that's in distress, time matters. So get that kid out of that car and we'll, we will all deal with it um, at the end of this. So how can we prevent this? Well, I think our first goal is to increase knowledge. So we wanna to talk to parents about never leaving a child in a car, even for a short period of time. Like we talked about in this gift shows, the temperature can in a car can rise very quickly, <clears throat> even on a relatively comfortable day. And cracking a window is just not enough to make it comfortable in there. But we also know that just knowledge doesn't help enough. So let's teach families some tricks so they can help them um, put into action. So I, I want families to not rely on memory. So have some sort of reminder. 
Now, recently there was a uh, bill that went through Congress that stated that um, car manufacturers have to include in-car warning systems, uh, either uh, when they detect a child in the back or the warning system has been set up. So that might sound like a chime or a um, some sort of overhead announcement in the car. Uh, those uh, Most cars do not have them yet. Uh, but be aware that that might be an option for your car and more and more cars should be having them in the future. Um, another method is the stuffed animal method. So you're going to put a stuffed animal in the car seat. When you buckle your child in, you're going to move that stuffed animal to the front seat. That acts as a visual reminder when you turn to get your briefcase, lunchbox, purse, whatever's in the front seat. Oh, there's a stuffed animal. I have to get the kid. Um, Another one I personally really like is put something that you need at your last, at your last stop in the back with the child. Because a lot of the stories I hear are, um, I, I was supposed to drop my kid off at daycare, but I had to run another errand on my way to work. And so I ran that errand and I didn't, re I didn't remember going, I had that I had to go to daycare and then I got out of work, I got out of work and I went right into the, right in and I didn't see them in the back seat. So that way, that forces you to go into the back seat, find some, find that thing you need, and avoid missing, uh, dropping off your child or bringing your child in somewhere. Uh, navigation apps. So I know Waze, uh, which is the one I use, has a child reminder that you can set up that will automatically, at the end of your navigation, have a little uh, warning that says, "Hey." Don't forget your child, and you can customize this to whatever uh, name you want. And then, as a last resort, I I don't really personally like follow like doing this, but make the habit that you have is that every time you get in the car, the last thing you do is open the back seat. Um, I think that's an extra layer of protection, but I like the other methods of reminding better. And then I think we need to train our children that cars are not toys. So the first thing is to keep that car locked. Um, store your keys out of reach. Uh, we need to talk to kids about not playing in cars. I know I let my I've let my nephews, you know, sit in the driver's seat. Looks like this kid's doing, pretend to drive, honk the horn. But then we also talk about how this is not a place he should be in without an adult. And then as a last resort, just like you're teaching them how to honk the horn, say, hey. If you ever got locked in a car and you couldn't get out, I want you to honk the horn and keep honking the horn until until someone can help you. Because honking the horn is a much easier thing than trying to figure out how to unlock a door. So what are some of the options that MIMS has for you um, if you want to set up your own um, prevention station? So they have the outdoor tripod temperature display. display. Uh, it has uh, the tripod stand, which you see there monitors that can and cables that can go inside the car to, to to show the temperature of the car you have a safe kids worldwide sign to hang below the monitors car sign magnets which we'll show in the next slide um, empty sandbags uh, some extension cord the things you need to provide are a vehicle to use and sand or water bottles to fill up those sandbags and you can request it by emailing if you want to pause the webinar right now, you can jot down that YouTube video, which trains you on how to set up the tripod temperature display. Uh, if you want to buy your own, you can um, uh, purchase one through Safe Kids DC. They're approximately $2,000. Um, you can buy the magnet signs displayed below, or you can borrow them from, from us. And uh, you will need to provide, you need an extension cord, which can be borrowed or can be purchased yourself. And the, then there are these handouts, whoops, that we can also offer to you. Um, and just remember that pediatric vehicular heat stroke is 100% preventable. So we have lots of uh, um, options and educational uh, tools available for you, for you to use in your work. So with that, uh, I will say thank you, and I uh, want you all to stay safe out there. This is my email in case you need to get in touch for anything. And uh, I, again, want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you.
Um, just a couple things I want to add to what she said. Um, she mentioned the Good Samaritan Law. Maryland does have a Good Samaritan Law. It says that if you help someone in good faith who is in need of medical assistance from a drug or alcohol, a medical emergency, you and the person you help are immune from criminal prosecution. And I'm not a lawyer, um, but I have heard that this is applicable in these cases. Um, but, you know, I think she made the good point that you call 911 first and then break a window. So they kind of have a documentation that you are doing things in the right order and getting the resources you need. All right, let me try to change screen here. Here we go. Okay, she also mentioned some engineering solutions to this problem. And just I wanted to say a little bit more about it. This is the rule that um, addresses having a built-in child safety alert system um, in cars. And this is was part of the Hot Cars Act, um, which was included in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was passed earlier this year. Um, so this will be happening in new cars. Um, some cars already have some of the capabilities to alert families, and it can work in various different ways. It can be just um, a sensor that notes that if you open the back door before you started your ride and you didn't at the end when you turn off the car, then it will alert you. Some of them have motion sensors. Some of them have carbon dioxide sensors. Um, car seats, some car seats have some functions that work to alert you, um, like for instance, in the chest clip. Um, so there could be lots of different configurations for how this will play out, but um, it will be in the uh, in cars coming up. And did I mention that $17 billion is uh, um, putting being put towards auto safety in that Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Okay, so changing gears just a little bit. Hopefully you were one of the 38 people who participated in my little survey monkey poll to find out what you as Maryland child passenger safety technicians are doing to educate about pediatric vehicular homicide. Homicide, why did I say that? Heat stroke, <laughs> it is a homicide. But in any case, um, so let me tell you a little bit about what I found out from you. Um, for those of you who are doing in-person seat checks, 47% um, of you said that you were talking about this with parents at every check, and 15% of you said that you were doing it with at checks where you had new parents or expectant parents, and then about a third of you weren't covering this topic at all. For virtual or online education, car seat education, quite a few of you aren't doing that, which you know, that's a whole different webinar, right, and topic. But for those that are covering um, car seat assistance online, um, about 30% said, well, actually, if you subtract those who aren't doing the virtual checks, it was more than half of you are covering this on your online surveys, and 25% are just covering it with new parents. Um, I asked if you were giving out any printed information on pediatric vehicular homicide, and most of you were. A um, little bit more than half were, so yes, that's we're getting, getting some progress there. Um, also, I asked what were some of the things that you were saying to families as you um, talked to them, as you educated them about um, heat stroke in cars, and this is word cloud word, so I asked you know, what were your top two tips? So these are the words that came up in those um, responses you gave. And um, a lot of the ones were the ones that Dr. Donnelly was mentioning, but I can tell you that the top ones of those that you provided me was check the back seat, um, never leave your child alone even for a moment, uh, put an item in the back um, when you have a child sitting in the car, an item that you would need like your briefcase or your phone or something. Um, setting alarms or reminders, and contacting the child care facility and asking them to tell you, to call you if your child doesn't arrive when that child's expected. So I think the bottom line here is really uh, to create a safety net of multiple strategies and then hopefully you can't go wrong. So moving along, I want to tell you a little bit more about some other resources. Safe Kids Worldwide has um, lots of great materials. So this is taken straight from their website, um, but they have handouts, they have infographics, they have videos. Um, so all of those things are available, some of them in Spanish. 
noheatstroke.org is a website um, that has been around quite some time and it's uh, by Jan Null, who's at the San Jose State University. He's actually a meteorologist. And he has put together some um, wonderful data and charts to go with it. So um, you're seeing a few of these here. Uh, you are allowed to use these charts um, as you want to use them for education. Um, and this is the uh, attribution that they recommend for using their materials. Um, they also have a, a newer thing that's an online training that goes into some um, some more about some of the technological aspects of heat stroke prevention. National Safety Council has a course. It's um, an online course and it's interactive. It's about a half an hour long. It's really excellent, so I would highly recommend doing that. The Maryland Department of Health, specifically their Office of Preparedness and Response, put together a PSA um, back in 2017 that's still very relevant. Um, that is on YouTube. You can um, access that and share that with um, share that on your social media. And then back to our temperature display that Dr. Donnelly described. I want to say just a few more words about it. Right now, we actually have very few people who have reserved it for the next two months. And as we know, it's plenty hot out. Um, so now would be a good time to uh, get on our calendar and, and borrow it. Um, in terms of you as child passenger safety technicians, about 41% of you said you have borrowed it. Uh, about a quarter of you said you know nothing about it. And the rest have heard of it, but just never used it. Um, but it, it's very easy to use. Um, there's two versions. There's the tripod version and there's the metal stand and there's training videos for how to use either version. We have used it all over the state and we have five kits across the state to make it pretty easy to borrow one. Um, we have found even when we did it in Allegheny County in March and it was 42 degrees outside and there was still snow on the ground that the inside of the car got up to 84 degrees. So I think our high point, our highest temperature recorded inside was something like 160, which was probably having the thermometer on the dashboard, but nonetheless, that's extremely hot. Um, these displays work great at fire station open houses, seat checks, fairs, outdoor vaccination clinics, um, really anything that's a pedestrian-centered event. Um, it's a little tricky putting it on a road because you don't want to be distracting drivers. But if you know there's a, a street a stoplight there and people have to sit there for a while, that might work. Um, I have included the sign-out form on our handouts if you want to borrow this um, for the future. We also have some posters and handouts. So that's a poster we have, and that's another variation of it and a bunch of handouts. Um, the stand-up banners look like the posters, um, but you can borrow those if you'd like. Now, those are for indoor events, not outdoor. They can't take any kind of wind. Um, I mentioned some of the handouts. So the, the flyer, just promoting the temperature display and how to borrow it is on there with the sign out checklist. The do's and don'ts of car seat use in and out of the car. That's a brand new handout. That covers heat stroke, but also some safe sleep tips, um, just general things for people who have little kids in car seats to keep them safe in various places and times. Um, the poster image of tips to prevent heat stroke is on there. And then I also included these slides that my slides here, not Dr. Donnelly's in the resources so that you could get the, the uh, links for everything. So that is the end of our prepared talk. And let's see what time it is. Uh, we have a few minutes for um, <clears throat> questions. Cindy, was there anything that uh, we could talk about other than the <laughs> not great sound? Yeah, there are two questions so far, and well, I'm going to read those to you, and then I'll unmute people so that they can actually um, ask questions. One question was, what was the number of deaths so far in 2022? And the second one um, will take a more complicated answer, which is typically, I educate not to put anything in the back seat because it might become a missile in the event of a crash. Is it recommended that keeping a needed object outweighs the risk of injury from an object within the car? 
Okay, um, I can answer both of those, but others can chime in. So as of yesterday, there were 14 deaths in the U.S. Yesterday's death was in Washington, D.C. to a three-month-old. Um, in terms of putting something in the back of the car, it could be something that really is fairly soft, uh, like, you know, your soft lunch bag with your sandwich in it, something like that. It could also be something that you tuck into one of the pockets that, you know, are built into your car in the back seat, like you putting your phone there. So it really wouldn't become um, a projectile in a crash. Um, you could probably tuck something under the car seat a little bit too, if, if you know, that might work as well. If anyone else wants to add to that, that would be fine. Their information on the tarp and ice treatment. Um, Susan, why don't you contact Danielle and I and we can put you in contact with Dr. Donnelly. Um, it is actually taught to athletic trainers um, and that is um, where that procedure is. It's not within the EMS scope of practice, but clearly we would not want to interfere with the certified athletic trainers if they were doing that. And that was really the message that Dr. Donnelly was trying to send. Um, I just want, this is Pam again. I just wanted to clarify, because I was taking the notes. Um, there were two slides, children forgotten in cars and children who put themselves in the car from the, from the other person's presentation. Um, and I just wanted to know, I know that the children who put themselves in the car, 26% of them have heat stroke death. Are the children who are forgotten in the car also getting heat stroke death at 53% or are they just getting heat stroke cases, illness? So those are deaths. Okay, deaths. Okay, wow. Pam, what we, what we have yet as a nation to identify um, and all of the state child fatality review committees across the country are struggling with this for multiple mechanisms of death um, is the near death. So someone, a child was found and a citizen or public safety responded. There's no reporting data element in law enforcement or EMS at the national level to capture that response. Um, so the children who survive um, are not a number we have found a way to capture. The media covers some of it, but that is not, that very unique numerator does not help us with the denominator of near misses, which is why, the, which is why both Safe Kids and um, NHTSA have the campaign of ACT. If you see a child, dial 911 and do something because there are children who are found and who are rescued. We just don't have a data element at a national level to tell you how many children are found in cars and resuscitated, whether that's just cooling off or whether it's a formal EMS resuscitation. Um, I bring that up annually with NHTSA, um, but adding data elements makes documentation more complicated. This is how you can get a hold of me. And uh, so if you do have any questions that come up or if you would like to obtain some of our materials, um, the easiest way to get a hold of me is cpsatmims.org or if you can spell my <laughs> name, then you can send it to me more directly. You can certainly call me. Um, I'd be glad to help you with the materials and um, I hope you will be uh, borrowing the temperature display. It really is very effective at getting people's attention. We can't say for sure if it saved anybody's lives, but we know education works in the grand scheme of things. So um, we really do want those to be used. So thank you so much for tuning into today's webinar. As I said, it will be archived.